Hey, Travis, can you hear me? This is Kyle Hines with the city of Dallas. Hey, Kyle. Yep, I, I can hear you just fine. Thanks for uh, jumping on the call early. Yeah, I always have issues with, um, with Zoom because the city of Dallas doesn't allow us to use it on our stuff. So uh, I always have to reset like every single one of my uh, settings. So I'm glad we're uh, in. So gotcha. Okay. Thanks. Well, uh, I've got you second in our lineup. So we'll cool. uh, introduce you and then feel free to turn your camera on uh, then. And uh, your audio is working good. So it should go smoothly. Okay. Thanks. Hi everyone, uh, looks like we have people continuing to join us. So we're going to go ahead and give it a couple more minutes uh, for people to, get, to join and get situated and then we'll get started. All right, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Sean Conrad with the Sustainable Development Team here at NCT COG. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, also from the Sustainable Development Team here, we have Travis Liska and Catherine Osborne and Sydney Steelman um, helping us out today. I'd like to welcome everyone to our October 2021 meeting with the Coordinated Land Use and Transportation Planning Task Force. 
Uh, thank you again for joining us. We developed the task force to provide a forum for North Texas local governments to discuss best practices related to coordinating land use and transportation plans, policies, and progress. So we hope today's discussion is valuable to you. We are recording this meeting and the recording will be posted on our website along with the presentations and the meeting summary. Uh, if you have any questions or comments at any time, feel free to enter those into the chat box. We'll have a few minutes after each presentation to take any questions related to the presentation. Uh, and then we also will have time for any other questions or general discussion or comments um, after we complete all of the presentations. Next slide, please. So today's meeting is the last of our 2021 task force meetings. We will continue to meet quarterly in 2022 and those meeting dates will be posted on our website soon at the link that you see there. Next slide, please. To start today, we have some local updates from Richardson and Dallas. We'll then move into presentations around our theme today, which is land use paying for transportation. And we'll also have presentations from cities of Irving, Plano, and Tyler. We'll wrap up with some time for overall questions, discussion, and announcements at the end. Uh, for our local updates, we'll hear from Doug McDonald, the Managing Director at the Office of Innovation and Placemaking at the City of Richardson. He's going to talk about the Rich Richardson Innovation Quarter District. And I will go ahead and pass it on to you, Doug. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, you may just let you know when the advanced slides. Would that be great? Yes. Uh, when you're ready, go ahead and just say uh, next slide. Yep, next slide. So appreciate the opportunity to kind of give you an update on what is going on in Richardson, um, particularly with our Richardson Innovation Quarter. Um, kind of real quick, getting kind of some history back in 09, we had a comprehensive plan that identified six enhancement areas along the, uh, the city. These are areas that were aging that needed some city investments and some uh, additional strategies for us for uh, redevelopment and reinvestment. So We've gone through now four different uh, four different areas. Um, our West Spring Valley Corridor being the first one, our downtown Main Street and US 75 Corridor being the second one. And then lastly, the East Arapahoe Collins area, which has now been rebranded as the Richardson Innovation Corridor. Um, this is kind of our, our fourth and we have two more coming, uh, coming soon for other enhancement areas that will be kind of taking on a, a city initiated strategy and rezoning strategy. Next slide. So the IQ is uh, right off 75. It is one of the uh, light rail stations. The Arapahoe Center Station is kind of the front door to the IQ, um, just north of our core district, which is our downtown area. Um, it has 1,200 acres, over 1,000 businesses, 19,000 that are employed. The two nearby institutions at Richland College and UT Dallas uh, play a really important role in what we're doing with the implementation of the IQ and having that research component uh, being part of the ecosystem uh, for the IQ has been really important for us. And um, I have a, the, a recent, more recent, recent announcement with UT Dallas that UT Dallas is planting a second flag here in Richardson um, in the IQ with uh, our new Office of Innovation and Placemaking. Um, we'll be co-sharing a facility and kind of bringing together our business community with the research and education community. Um, the area is really perfect for startups and scale-ups because of the affordability and the scalability of these buildings. Uh, these buildings were built back in the 70s and 80s during the uh, kind of telecom boom in Richardson. And these were the supply chain businesses, the TIs and Ericsson's and Collin Radio. And they've now gone through a whole generation of new uses. And now we're kind of coming back in and trying to reinvent this area as the premier tech hub of Texas. Next slide. Um, 2017, we had a chamber task force that really kind of kicked off this process, um, looking at exploring some innovation districts across the country looking at some zoning barriers that were in place for reinvestment of properties and looking at what the city should be doing in terms of investment and what the private sector can be following um, after. In 2018, we kicked off a year-long vision study and strategies. We looked at transportation, um, open space, market analysis, did a lot of public engagement to get to where we are today. Uh, next slide. I uh, mentioned the vision being that this is going to be the premier tech hub in Texas, and this is actually a rendering of our Rappahoe Center Station at the development side. Uh, next slide. Um, being the continue to be the center of innovation and entrepreneurship, that is really the DNA here of Richardson, the pioneering technology um, that uh, we have in our DNA. Um, being visually gr unique, green, lively, and active, trying to incorporate more green space and open space with the district. 
being walkable and bikeable, and then having that station area serve as a primary gateway to the IT. Next slide. These are the strategies. I won't read through them all, but these 10 strategies, every time we kick off a new study or a new initiative in the IQ, it has to match up with one of these 10 strategies. You'll see that loading, uh, allowing zoning flexibility industrial zones has actually been completed that we did a full year long process of rezoning the entire 1200 acres to align with the vision and strategy that was developed back in 2018. Uh, but you also see things like redeveloping key opportunity sites, things like the, the Rappos Center Station, which I'm gonna really kind of key in on um, in these next few slides. And then you'll see kind of creating a shared innovation space, which is what we're doing right now with UT Dallas with our new uh, IQ headquarters. Next slide. So in 2019, I mentioned we kicked off the rezoning, the city initiated rezoning uh, of that 1200 acres. We launched a number of demonstration projects working with Better Block um, to do a road diet here along Greenville Avenue, uh, which has now been um, installed permanently. I'm also doing some uh, pop-ups along uh, Duck Creek, which is a kind of a key creek throughout the corridor. A lot of more public engagement and then looking at some mobility and capital improvement planning around the station area. Next slide. The overall direction uh, based on our form base code is that we were trying to remove barriers and increase the flexibility to allow more development potential on each site. Um, trying to limit as many non-conforming uses as possible and really allowing more of an additive layer of allowable uses throughout this district. Um, trying to emphasize Duck Creek as that key district amenity. Positioning the Rappo Center Station as that walkable mixed use front door to the district. Um, introducing some residential uses. So this area was about 90% zoned industrial before we came through and did a form based code and now has a lot more flexibility of adaptive reuse and live work uh, and in multifamily for where we're appropriate to support, to support the employment activity. And then looking at where we can maintain access for trucks where needed, but also add multimodal improvements where we could um, incorporate some new modes throughout the district. Next slide. Um, the 1200 acres kind of got split up into four different sub-districts and the, the sub-district I'm going I'm to focus on here with this audience is just a station area to show you what we've done um, so far and what is kind of in the pipeline for the next six to 12 months. Next slide. So the station area really I mentioned to be that, that walkable mixed use front door supporting existing businesses. We did uh, create four and auto related non-conforming uses uh, with the new rezoning. Um, we also had a lot more wide range of uses and activities trying to bring to the area, increasing flexibility uh, for the building envelope, um, reducing setbacks, things like that, and also creating opportunities for new residential uses to support that employment base that we already have existing. Next slide. Uh, with the new form base code, we have now minimum densities for residential uses and allowing multifamily buy right, um, requiring retail ready on the ground floor for residential uses fronting uh, Greenville Avenue, so trying to have a more active street frontage along Greenville Avenue, uh, which is a key corridor and key north south corridor throughout the IQ. Uh, we do not have minimum parking requirements for the residential component of a mixed use development. So if you're bringing in a mixed use development that has work ground floor retail, you're only required to park the ground floor retail. Uh, we did that knowing that the market is going to and the lenders are going to require the parking regardless. So we are, have now got out of the parking game here in this area. And then there's no maximum building height restrictions in the IQ uh, in the uh, station area. Um, this photo is right here kind of show you the illustration of what is out there today. Basically, a lot of surface parking and what could be uh, developed in the future based off this current form based code. Next slide. So since the adoption, we've done a lot of work in, in the IQ and, and particularly in the station area. I uh, mentioned we launched a new district name and branding, the, the Richardson IQ or the IQ. Um, that's actually been really important for us as we start telling our story and telling um, recruiting businesses in this area that it has its own identity and its own look and feel. Uh, Greenville Avenue bike lanes have now been installed along the corridor. Um, these are protected bicycle facilities. Um, our station area improvements. So we actually worked with DART to improve the safety uh, pedestrians crossing Greenville Avenue. We actually had an underground tunnel. Uh, if you've ridden the station um, previously, the underground tunnel was the only way you could get to the station. We've now created an at-grade crossing now that we've narrowed down the lanes from six lanes to four lanes and allowed it a lot more protection for pedestrians crossing uh, the station. Um, this was actually a really big issue for us because we had uh, riders trying to catch the train and they would run across the street and have to jump over the fence to catch the train. So this provides a much more efficient uh, way to get to the light rail station and a better way to incorporate the light rail station into the overall development. Um, we've done a redesign of, um, working right now on a redesign of the Greenville Rappel intersection, which will have its first bicycle signals um, along in the city of Richardson. 
um, completing the Apple Center Station bus study. So we worked with DART to identify different development scenarios where we can incorporate the, the bus facility within the, the streetscape or incorporate it into a public parking garage or even actually move it over to the uh, west side of the street adjacent to the light rail station. So that was completed along with a lot of TOD planning um, in preparation of going out to, um, to solicit a master developer to come in for this site. Uh, we've also kicked off a smart cities toolkit to really position the station area as, as a, a regional mobility hub. Um, because of the bicycle facilities, because Central Trail runs through here, um, also the, the bus facilities and having a transit center and then the light rail facility, it, it really lends itself to be a really unique mobility hub in the region. And so we want to position this area to be that, that hub. Um, we also completed an interlocal agreement between DART and the city of Richardson, um, similar to, to uh, the town of Addison, um, where this, essentially DART has now leased the land to the city and the city is acting as an agent of DART um, to solicit a master developer to come in and develop the, the, the Arapahoe Center Station. So we are now um, working with Christian Wakefield. They're assisting us in the marketing and solicitation and actually selecting a master developer to come in to uh, redevelop the Arapahoe Center Station. And that was, that was probably about a 12 month uh, process to get through that interlocal agreement and get the ideas uh, through both our city council and also the DART board uh, to allow this to progress uh, and to redevelop in the future. Uh, we've also kicked off a recently an innovation hub market feasibility study um, to have a purpose built innovation facility um, built here at the Arapaho Center Station where the city, the University of Texas at Dallas and also the Chamber of Commerce would be partners um, in the construction of this facility. Uh, next slide. And that's what I got for you. So I wanted to really appreciate you giving me an opportunity to give you an update on what's going on, uh, particularly around the station area. Um, I also mentioned the partnership we have with UT Dallas and creating the new innovation hub that'll be open up in March timeframe. My office will get moved out there. So I welcome you all to come and visit us. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me and I'll be happy to answer your questions. And uh, Travis, you all, I really appreciate the opportunity. All right, thank you, Doug, we appreciate that. Uh, next, we'll get some updates from Kyle Hines. He is Assistant Director of Housing and Neighborhood Revitalization at City of Dallas. Uh, he'll be talking about the city's 1,000 unit TOD housing challenge. Take it away, Kyle. All right, thanks everybody. And thank you for the opportunity to give everybody an update. Uh, if you wanna to go to the next slide uh, and the next one. We, so yeah, so I don't know how much anybody has heard about our 1,000 unit housing challenge, but uh, several of our council members and, and chairmen of some of our committees all got together to uh, challenge housing staff uh, the various departments in the city to uh, come up with, to activate some of our vacant site, vacant city owned and DART owned sites near our DART rail stations throughout the city to provide affordable housing and mixed income housing transit oriented developments um, at, these, at these stations. Uh, the, the challenge was to issue construction permits for all of these units by August 30th, 2021. Obviously it's October and I'm here giving you an update on the planning process. So we didn't, didn't quite hit that goal. Uh, that was an ambitious challenge, but uh, I think we did, we did a pretty good job of identifying sites as, and uh, development partners, as you'll see uh, on the next few slides. So if you want to advance. So the staff from the Office of Economic Development, Planning, Urban Design and Housing, we all identified city owned land near our DART stations uh, that would be uh, position, well positioned for a TOD development. Uh, we ultimately found five sites that were actually available, didn't have um, serious environmental concerns, were actually a uh, half acre or larger and within a half mile of, an, of, of one of our DART rail stations. So uh, once we identified those those sites, we issued an RFP in January of this year. And in May of this year, after a lot of uh, engagement with the development community, uh, scoring, the, scoring the projects, we ended up approving three preliminary proposals in May of this year. So if you wanna go to the next slide. The sites that we, that we did identify uh, were around our Camp Wisdom dart rail station, our VA hospital dart rail system, uh, the 1900 Wheatland Road was also our Camp Wh Wisdom station. Uh, the Al Lipscomb, Al Lipscomb Way is uh, in Fair Park near our MLK station. And the uh, 3039 is also along the Lancaster Boulevard, kind of between the MLK station and Keist uh, Dart Rail stations in the Lancaster corridor. 
they all have uh, various um, zoning uh, requirements that we'll have to work through our, that process, but our planning and urban design department will be assisting our developers to expedite uh, whatever zoning changes we need to accommodate the development um, at those sites. So if you wanna go to the next slide. We ultimately received three, two of the, the, the 1900 Wheatland Road and 3039 South Lancaster Road did not end up receiving any uh, proposals from developers at those sites. I think when, when we look back on it, some of some of there were quite the right amount of acreage to to uh, you know get it, get a, a good quality project there, or there might be infrastructure issues that would have been cost prohibitive uh, to move forward in a timely manner uh, on those two sites. However, we did end up receiving uh, high quality proposals on the 40, 4515 South Lancaster, which was formerly known as Patriots Crossing. It's directly across the street from the VA hospital. And the DART stop is literally right in front of this, this site. We also received a proposal uh, from Bryn Shore Development uh, for 3015 El Lipscomb Way, which is, like I said, in Fair Park. And then uh, our, DART, our, our DART station at Camp Wisdom, uh, we received a proposal uh, for 6601 South Lancaster. All told, we're at about 732 units. We didn't quite hit the thousand units um, that that we wanted. However, I think some of the the, the, the constraints on the sites. Um, I mean, this is probably going to be the highest and best use we can get. And I can talk about some of the other uh, strategies that are being undertaken to kind of increase this this number in future slides. So, if you want to go next. So here's the, here's the site and an aerial view of uh, the 3015 uh, Lipsum Way. It's a long and narrow site. It's about two acres. Um, if you were at the fair this, uh, at the state fair this year, you might have driven by this. Um, it's, right, it's right on out Lipscomb Way, walking distance to the MLK station. And you can technically also walk to the Fair Park uh, Dart Station as well. Um, site is vacant and, um, and, and, and we'll and it has, has very surrounding uses uh, near the site. So if you wanna to go to the next slide, please. So right now, as it stands, the proposal included 89 units of rental housing that was spread across 30% AMI all the way up to market rate. It'd be two, they wanted to have two story retail uh, facing Al Lipscomb podium construction. It was anticipated to be uh, uh, $25.6 million um, the city owned project site is long and narrow, and we're actually working with the developer to assemble more lots near this site. We have a couple of land bank lots that are available that we're going to put into this project as well. Um, South Fair CDC is a, is a, is a nonprofit developer um, in the area that is partnered on this deal, and they also own some sites. And then we have a couple other landowners in the area that we're negotiating with to actually increase the size of this project uh, because right now the long narrow sites not necessarily what we'd consider the highest and best use. So if we can get more, more land area, we can, we can add the number of units and make a better, better project for both the future residents and the community as a whole. Cause we feel this can be an excellent catalytic project uh, for the, for this area. So right now when, after council approved all of these developments, we entered into and have executed right of entries with uh, Brent Shore and their development group to begin doing due diligence, uh, working on the land assemblage. And we hope to have that sorted out uh, by the end of the year and then start going through the planning process. And then also our urban design peer review panel to get comments on the design and make sure that, you know, what we're putting on the ground near the start station can, act, can actually serve as economic development and catalytic project for the area. So we wanna go to the next slide. Um, I just have a couple of, of design concepts that were that were submitted. They want to have kind of a terraced roof to have more community space. Uh, there'd be public open green space. And we're hoping that by adding more uh, units, more land area to the site, we can have more green space, more walkability and really activate the the uh, the neighborhood. Next slide. And next slide. So the next site is uh, 6601 South Lancaster Road. Uh, this is uh, near uh, Camp Wisdom Dart Station and also uh, UNT Dallas. It's one stop away from UNT Dallas. It's uh, two stops away from the VA uh, Medical Center and maybe I think five stops from, from downtown along uh, the, the 
the dark blue line. Um, it's a pretty large site. It's 10.1 acres. If you want to go to the next slide, I can talk about uh, what they're planning there. So this is a, a will be an extremely large development. We're at about almost $72 million. Uh, and they're, they're going to have a, a mix of small scale apartments, cottage flats, garden homes, and townhomes, all, all rental, about 303 units, um, ranging from 45 to 100% AMI, plus market rate developments. Uh, this is a proposal uh, brought to us by Innovon Neighborhoods and Matthew Southwest. Um, Matthew Southwest actually owns the site directly to the east of this on the hard corner of Crouch Road and Lancaster. And that will allow us to have uh, even more, like to activate not only our site, but their site and bring in a lot of community space, uh, multi-use multi, multi -use commu the community hill, which you'll see uh, that'll make sense in a second when you look at the elevation of the site. Dog runs, players and, and picnic areas. Um, they'll have a pedestrian friendly layout throughout the site. Um, and uh, it's designed to kind of serve the, the needs of the area. We have uh, various stakeholders. We'll have, have students plus university employees from UNT Dallas, which like I said, was just a, a stop down the way and families and seniors. So we've executed a right of entry agreement with Innovon and they're currently doing their due diligence on the site. We'll have, we'll continue to work on the design and then also have that go through our, our peer review panel. Uh, they anticipate par partnering with our new uh, public facility corporation that was, was approved last year. We finally have a board to start approving projects and we'll also be providing them with some sort of gap financing, whether it be home or CDBG development funds. So next slide, there's several uh, pictures. So here's the, here's the layout. They'll have community green spaces between each, each of the units, but also have, have parking tucked in, into the rear. And then they also have a community um, a, a community center up on the cor at the corner of South Lancaster Road and, and Crouch Road. If you go to the next slide, the topography of the site. So that's why it's called a community hill. You can see starting from the left on all the way to the right, there, it gently slopes up and they anticipate having a community amenity center at the top of that hill that'll be open to both the residents and the community that, because there will be, we anticipate having a lot of different development. Uh, this is in our UNT Dallas uh, full comprehensive plan. So um, this aligns quite well with that. And we're, we're hoping to activate that, that hard corner, corner at Crouch Road and, and Lancaster. So next slide. Here's one of their concepts. Obviously our urban design peer review panel will be reviewing all of this. This was just, uh, their 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 plans and, and renderings uh, that they they assembled pretty quickly because of our quick timeline. We were trying to get as close to August as we August 2021 20, as we could. But you see, here's another slide. And if you want to keep going, keep going. So there's a variety of different uses there or different housing types. So um, depending on the, the who's going to be living there, obviously, we have a lot of, of different options at that site. And then the last, the last site is 4515 South Lancaster Road. Uh, this is, it's an area of 7.6 acres. Like I said, it's directly across the street from the VA Medical Center. So um, this site has been vac vacant for quite some time. We've had various proposals on this throughout the year. However, I think uh, through this housing, through the thousand unit housing challenge, I think we finally have a winner and uh, something that, that will activate this corridor and uh, bring in some, some mixed use development. So if you want to go to the next next slide. So Lavoro Capital was the was the uh, awarded uh, developer for this project. They're proposing 340 units of rental housing, about $54 million in total development. We'll have, uh, this is using a traditional PF public facility corporation structure. So they'll have 17 units at 60% AMI, 158 units at 80% AMI, and then we're also going to have 165 units at market rate. We felt this this was extremely important to have market rate units so that um, people that may be that may make over 80% AMI that work at the VA can still be able to have be able to live and, and work directly across the street from from the campus, but then also be able to take take Dart to other areas of the city. Um, and so so it is, it, is a, it is a great proposal. Uh, we're, we're happy that they also have integrated retail pads situated situated along uh, Lancaster Boulevard. Um, retail is a, a big community uh, request at this site. So we're, we're, we're going to make sure we have all of that in there. Uh, it'll be a four-story wrap product with parking surrounded by residential. 
Um, we have ex executed a right of en entry agreement with with the Royal Capital, and they they've conducted new. They're they're quite a ways along. They have uh, they've gone. They've done a, several community meetings, and they're about ready to go through our design review panel. I've also received an application from them to be for a partnership with the Dallas Public Facility Corporation. So we're very excited about this this development. If you want to go to the next slide, you can take a look at the, the site plan and, and layout. They're currently tweaking this based, based on community feedback and also with um, the, our, our peer review panel for the design. Uh, you can see that they're 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 making sure that our our, our retail and restaurant pads are, are are located right along Lancaster Boulevard. They're also going to have a community space. If you can see the light blue area there uh, up up front, and then several other retail spaces. And then they have uh, they they try to have a, a match the kind of the the, the neighborhood slope for the, the single family neighborhood behind this with public open spaces in, inside of each of those three courtyards that you can see there. You wanna to go to the next slide. This is just a, another kind of massing layout on, on what, what they want. I mean, I, we all know what TOD development stri strives to, um, to, to activate uh, sidewalks and, and neighborhoods. And, and we felt that this was uh, a great concept plan so far. Uh, next slide. So we're currently uh, just in our next steps on this. Uh, we're, we're currently working with them to make sure that we have all of our environmental reviews completed, um, applications for city gap funding for some of these uh, P DPFC partnerships, like I said, our urban design peer review panel, and then community engagement and necessary zoning changes. We, we anticipate being able to uh, close financing on all of these projects sometime in 2022. Each project has has unique challenges, and we're working through either, each of those. And they're not all going to close at once, but we'll be working on each of them and guiding them through our, our city processes here. Next slide. And I also wanted to mention because these are our city-owned sites that were that were being that were included in this thousand-unit housing challenge. However, um, the message that it sent was to the private development community that we are trying to activate land near our Dart rail stations. So we have a total underdevelopment on private land of, of 1,162 units. Um, so we have at the Camp Wisdom Dart Center, our Bishop Art Street, our streetcar, uh, the Royal Lane Dart Station, Westmoreland Dart Station, and, in, and the Inwood Dart Station. Uh, these are all under underway at various stages of development. Ridget Lancaster, Gateway Oak Cliff, Westmoreland, and Westmoreland Station all closed this summer and are now they're, they're at the site grading, and we, we, we hope to be uh, finished with these developments in, within two years. These were all 4% um, uh, LIHTC developments and are partnering with our Housing Finance Corporation. So if you want to go to the next slides. Here's, a, there, here's just a map of where we have uh, private development underway and our, our city-owned developments underway. So. We're, we're spread out through the city, and I think the message is out there that we are certainly open for business to try to activate land near our DART rail stations to provide density, walkable communities, and, and reduce our, our, our traffic, reduce car traffic, and all of the, the great things that TODs can, um, can provide for us. I will say I do know that we are also under underway in trying to get an ILA in the works with DART to uh, activate dart owned land and and execute ground leases on those sites that's underway but um that's not as far along as what it sounds like the city of richardson's in but i think uh we all want we all want to strive to to activate activate all of this land near our dart rail station so we're, we're very excited about moving forward and i think that's the last slide and there it is so um once again, thanks everybody for your time and interest in our in, in what we're doing here in the city of Dallas. We're um, we're excited, and if anybody has any questions or wants to talk about any of these developments or strategies, I'm more than happy. You can email me or, or call me at any time. So, but thanks again. I appreciate the invite and and look forward to hearing from everybody. Great. Uh, thank you, Doug and Kyle, for those updates. We appreciate that very much. Uh, we'll get started now on our uh, presentations around land use theme for transportation, our theme for today. Uh, first, we'll have Travis Liska uh, do a brief introdu introduction on the topic, and then we'll move on to our guest speakers. 
Thanks, Sean. And uh, thank you, Kyle and Doug, too. I want to say that was those were great, great presentations. A lot of tools and information that I think other municipalities in the region could pick up there. Uh, I just want to also invite, if you're a municipality who's also doing something interesting or uh, maybe it's just mildly interesting, feel free to uh, reach out to us and provide a local update as well. A uh, lot going on in the region. Uh, so uh, yeah, those are our, our local updates. Uh, and now we're going to kind of shift into uh, the themed panel discussion uh, for today, really focused on, on value capture and, and how our, our land uses are essential to paying for our transportation infrastructure improvements. Um, and, you know, this is um, really about uh, tax increment finance as one of the big things, but the larger uh, issue is really the property tax that is sort of our, our big value capture tool. Uh, so we think many of our municipalities in the region are familiar with uh, tax increment reinvestment zones and other value capture methods. So we want to do a quick uh, survey of everyone. And I think Sydney just put the link into the chat. Uh, if you want to uh, grab that link and uh, fill out that quick survey, or you can use your phone to scan the QR code we've got here on the screen. We want to know if perhaps uh, those of you in the audience today are familiar uh, with the, the tax and current reinvestment zones. Maybe you're, you're not super familiar with them or maybe you are working on some other method of value capture or familiar with that, or uh, maybe you're sort of tangentially involved. Uh, I am going to sort of pull up the results of that quick survey just to get an idea of whom we are uh, talking to this afternoon. All right, so I think we should be seeing a little bar chart here. It looks like we've got four folks who've responded to say they are working directly with the uh, TIP districts, and then a few that are also familiar but not directly involved. So let's just give it uh, one more minute. And um, Note that uh, today we're going to hear from uh, a couple of uh, cities in our, our region who are are using um, tax and current reinvestment zones. So we're going to get that uh, direct uh, case study experience there. And then we also have um, uh, Tom Yontis uh, from Taylor from out of our region talking about uh, really the larger value capture element. So it looks like we have uh, most of the folks who are responding who are somewhat familiar with it, uh, if they're not directly involved, and then a few people who are directly involved. So uh, sounds like uh, we've got a pretty advanced group here, but we'll also do a lot of explanation today. So thank you, uh, everyone, for responding to that. And I'm going to see if I can get successfully back to our PowerPoint. Okay, so why are we talking about this particular topic today? Um, as you may know, uh, there is not necessarily abundant transportation funding um, that is guaranteed into the future. Uh, we know our infrastructure costs are rising. I've just pulled a couple of items from our long range transportation plan. As you know, NCT COG is very engaged in this question of how do we construct and build a transportation infrastructure that, that the region needs. Um, and of course, we estimate we're going to need a lot of funding to do that. But at the same time, um, as we all know, federal transportation dollars are becoming more challenging and scarce uh, to access in some ways. And the cost of building everything is um, getting much, much higher, especially in the recent time period. And so it's really important for uh, our local governments to be strategic uh, about how we pay for things. And uh, obviously, as I mentioned, one of the tools we wanna focus on that uh, we think is, is really frequently being used in this region in various ways is the uh, Texas enabled tool of tax increment reinvestment zones. And I won't go into a detailed explanation of these as, I'm, as I think many of you are familiar with them, but uh, basically it's a process where we establish a zone around an area where improvements are desired and general improvement is, is believed to be needed. 
and with the anticipation that there's going to be tax revenue increases over time, and we're taking the increments uh, that is the increase and dedicating that towards a specific project, uh, generally infrastructure, but not exclusively infrastructure. Uh, and so uh, if you're interested in more details on introductory level of information to that, we've got a, um, this graphic here is from the Texas Transportation Institute, and they're a good resource for a general explanation as well as other entities. Um, but what we also did prior to today's meeting was uh, really test this question of uh, how familiar are municipalities in North Texas with uh, tax increment finance and uh, tax increment re reinvestment zones. So we looked at the 50 um, most populous jurisdictions, uh, municipalities in the region. So those are those that have about over uh, 23, 24,000 people. And um, the large majority, 45 of the 50, are using at least one um, tax increment reinvestment zone in their community. So pretty common in our region. And so that's 132 districts we were able to inventory. As you saw sort of from the map, the, the larger the city uh, generally, and there's obviously more land area, the more districts they had, generally speaking. Um, we also noticed that uh, for many communities, if they had one um, tax increment reinvestment zone, it was going to be around their downtown or main street uh, general um, trend there, but we didn't really dive into the type of projects that were funded. Uh, but again, we have invited a few folks here today to talk about sort of what that looks like in some specific cases. So the, the real question um, we can sort of follow up on in discussion here is how are our cities using value capture? And then really how do we position our land use that uh, we're coordinating with transportation to really maximize our ability to pay for transportation? And so think about those um, and maybe uh, listen to the speakers and, and uh, think of some questions we can have a dialogue around as, as these get going. Um, but to really tell us how the city of Irving is using tax increment finance and, and one project that I know is recently uh, really getting underway, we've invited uh, Emil Despec with the city of Irving to um, talk about how they're using tax increment finance for Irving Boulevard. So thanks, Emil, Travis. Yeah, Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me and appreciate the opportunity to tell you all, all about Irving Boulevard and what we're doing there. So go ahead and next slide. <clears throat> So for those of you not familiar with Irving Boulevard, it's in the, the south part of Irving from 183 to the north down to Loop 12 on the east. And the part that we'll really focus in on today is our downtown there highlighted in the uh, red box. Uh, next slide. So this project has been um, over a decade long in the making. Back in 2008, we had an enhancement study studying the entire corridor, and this helped to establish the vision for the entire corridor um, looking at how to make it a more diversified, pedestrian friendly and mixed use neighborhood, I identify infrastructure improvements, streetscape enhancements, and both short and long term strategies to help stimulate and sustain our revitalization effort for South Irving. Um, and after that, we created our TIF 2 or Irving Boulevard TIF. Um, so it was our second TIF in Irving. Um, to help be this cash generating um, tool to reimburse the cost of the public improvements, which I'll get to, which is um, a portion of Irving Boulevard, but through the redevelopment of the vacant underutilized uh, properties along the corridor, and then protect the major investment that we were making downtown. Um, as part of that, a vital component to the overall success of our downtown redevelopment was the reconstruction, or is the reconstruction of Irving Boulevard, a portion of it that runs downtown that becomes the couplet. So it divides into two one-way couplets. Um, so we worked with um, a consultant to help us remove the, uh, that portion of Irving Boulevard from the state highway system. Next slide, please. So here's just an aerial zoomed in of downtown just to show the portion that was removed. The other one way portion of 2nd Street was removed back in 2003, um, but the State Highway 356 portion was removed in 2016, 2017, started working on uh, 2016, removed in 2017. And this was um, some of, I'm sure most of you know, is a big deal because this means we didn't have to comply with TxDOT guidelines for the design of Irving Boulevard. Uh, next slide. A next uh, 
portion of this or tool that we did was approve new zoning, which I think you heard uh, some themes of this with the Richardson update, uh, the zoning to be more um, pedestrian, mixed use zoning for the area. And I'll dive into this a little later, but this is another tool to help with making sure the land is developed in accordance with what we wanna see and help generate that cash flow. Uh, next slide. In 2018 was a, another big year for us as we approved uh, several agreements um, that helped with the financing of the project. So we have an ILA with COG that um, provides $12 million in advance funding to for the Irving Boulevard project. It's, it's for the surface improvements only. And it's a companion to our TIF um, project and financing plan because revenues generated from the TIF will go back and contribute a like amount back to COG for the life of the TIF. Um, and so we approved that, we approved the project financing plan, and then we also approved uh, Dallas County's uh, TIF participation. So we have another stream of contribution coming in. And lastly, just to receive the funds, um, a, a part of that um, process was approving an advanced funding agreement with TechSot, which we did last year to actually receive the funds. Uh, next slide. So getting into the TIF here, uh, here's a boundary map. And again, the yellow, um, um, Rectangle is the area of downtown. This is the one mile stretch of the Irving Boulevard construction. Uh, next slide. Um, this is a summary of the funding allocations for the TIF. You'll see majority of the funds are going towards Irving Boulevard. And the way this TIF works is it is on reimbursement. So as the TIF generates funds, we will um, again contribute a like amount back to COG for the $12 million, as well as reimburse other funds that uh, city funds that are helping to pay for this project. But as mentioned, um, this as in addition to the public improvement, we are also using funds to um, provide grants for corridor and facade enhancements. So that way we can distribute some of the reinvestment along the entire corridor or within the entire TIF boundary. So um, and then again, that will have, you know, hopefully put a dollar in, uh, make two dollars back on that taxable um, income or value, excuse me. Next slide. <clears throat> Here is a summary of uh, from our project and financing plan of what we anticipate to see how the TIF performs. So we anticipate $29.7 million in revenue and a projected cumulative develop val development value of 361 million. You'll notice here, originally we started in 2010 of 206 million. Um, and then when we, also approved the project and financing plan, we expanded the boundaries. So this reestablished our base year um, for the increment. And so that was at 214. And it was very key for us to do this because we own several um, property sites in the downtown area that were left out of the original boundary map. And we do anticipate we're going out to RFP for several of those in the next um, year or so that to, um, to bring forth or continue the momentum of redevelopment in the area. Um, next slide. And the way we uh, did the, our projections is we looked at all the parcels within the area and looking at our future land use map and what we would anticipate, the timing that we anticipated given the timing of the uh, Irving Boulevard reconstruction and how um, our TIF would perform. Um, we broke things down into short term, long term adaptive reuse and then no change. Majority of our Western half about, we anticipate about 1.3 million square feet of redevelopment, and that would be more of the long-term. We have several apartment buildings and a, lar and a former large shopping center that's mainly vacant that we plan um, or we anticipate to be redeveloped. Downtown area, the central is another 1.3 million square feet. This will be our short-term, um, again, because we own a lot of property in this area. And then on the east, it's more fragmented ownership and some still significantly economic viable businesses in the area. So here are short and long term speculations. Uh, projections are a little more speculative on how quickly they would turn over. Um, but you'll see all the red here. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, it, here's the chart that breaks down what we anticipate and develop in um, new taxable um, value coming in. So our redevelopment of 2016 and 2025, and we did 2016, just so you know, because we um, approved the project and financing plan in 2018, and we had a project that was on the books coming um, underway in 2016. So just so you understand why it's those dates. 
<clears throat> and then the later half was 2016 to 2040. Our adaptive reuse here, we anticipated a 5% increase every five years. And these were for buildings that are sites that we anticipated that wouldn't necessarily be demoed and reconstructed, but um, reused in some capacity. So maybe a gas station turning into um, a restaurant of some kind. We've seen that in several dis uh, cultural districts being reused. So those types of properties are what fell into this category. Uh, next slide. Um, a companion item is our ILA again with COG. So this is a very um, big piece in getting um, the Irving Boulevard uh, project underway. So this go is a companion to our TIF because starting actually this uh, fiscal year, we will start to contribute a like amount of 80% of our TIF revenues back to COG um, for that advanced funding. Um, we retain the 20% to go towards the other funding allocations. Um, once this is uh, fully repaid, which we do anticipate based on our project and financing plan, um, we would retain all the re uh, remaining funds coming, revenue coming in. Um, but I do wanna say this is um, a, a neat model because it is not considered a debt for us. So if we are not, if there's not enough revenue to repay COGA over the 20 years left in the TIF, then there's no further obligation for the city um, to contribute that like amount. Uh, next slide. Um, next, as I mentioned, we, um, we approved our form-based code zoning in 2017. So this was a, a big step to, in regards to land use to help capture that the value is we wanted to set the stage of what we, the type of uh, development we want for the area. So we heard this, I think from Richardson and Dallas on different zoning that they've put in place. Um, so we had a unified vision passed in the early 2010s, and this helped codify that vision and uh, provide the consistency of what we wanted to see, because prior to that, we just had an overlay district. And then within this base district, we created character zones. So in the red is our transit-oriented mixed-use um, zone. So here we, this is around our DART station, um, where we anticipate this will be longer-term redevelopment, but higher density, so um, larger multifamily and other TOD development. Um, the purple here are court, it's corridor mixed use, so it transitions from the density of transit to the orange, which is neighborhood mixed use, so you'll see it does allow for um, up to six stories multi, sorry, it allows for multifamily up to three stories, um, but you have single family and uh, townhomes in this. And then our neighborhood mixed use, um, it would not allow your larger multifamily projects and the smallest one would be a single family home here. So you'll notice mixed use in all of it. There are differentiating uses um, in some of the character zones, but a uh, majority of them are the same. Next slide. Um, and again, this helps to bring in that more pedestrian oriented type of development. Um, another um, uh, term is the traditional neighborhood development that we want to see in the area. Buildings built up to the street to the right of way versus pushed back. So we're reducing the uh, auto function. So having all the parking in the back, limiting drive through lanes where they're not on the main corridors of Irving and Second, but they're on the back of the building. Um, this will help to minimize the conflicts between vehicle and pedestrians, creating that walkable environment that we want to see downtown. Uh, next slide. Now I'm going to get into the implementation or development implementation. So the main one being Irving Boulevard, which is about to kick off here. So um, our, it's considered a road diet project as well, reducing the lanes from three to two lanes. And with the um, additional right of way that captured with that reduction, we're um, increasing the sidewalk and bulb outs to um, create enhance the pedestrian amenities and make it safer for our pedestrians crossing the street and or walking along the boulevard. Um, we're also revamping all of the underground utilities for our current and future development that we anticipate in the area. Next slide. We did a major stakeholder outreach um, at the beginning of the Irving Boulevard project to get an idea of what people are wanting to see in this project as it, this one mile stretch will impact over a hundred different businesses. Um, businesses alone and multiple property owners. So a big thing here was strengthening our Heritage Crossing District, creating these entrance portals. So how do we tie um, both ends of the couplet together and throughout that one mile? Um, creating uh, the public infrastructure streetscape with um, minimal um, and low maintenance landscaping, 
um, and improving the lighting to create, it, making it more safe for pedestrians. And then in regards to land use, how do we minimize the impacts to our surrounding businesses? And also making sure that we're developing or, or creating this design that's going to help attract the restaurants and retail that our um, residents and visitors wanna see in the area. Next slide. Um, this slide to me is very important because we have this big grand idea for a design, this walkable environment um, in downtown that we want, but there's the reality of what's actually the built environment as it is. So looking at just this one mile stretch, we have three different zones coming from the east. Um, you'll see the blue there is showing a bunch of vast parking lots, various um, loose organization of driveways. A lot of the properties are um, they're tiny parcels, but long and skinny. So you'll have driveway, 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 then opening. And so it's not very safe or it doesn't feel safe for pedestrians walking along this area. You get into the downtown area, it's more of that traditional uh, retail and offices closer together and forming this hub out of Main Street. So a more defined pedestrian character. Then going to the west, it opens up to our park and our city facilities. So in order to... Um, uh, build the type of inf this new roadway that we wanted to attract the businesses and, and, and have the format of buildings that we want. We had to figure out how to design it with what we have today, but to, um, to adapt to future development. So next slide. So for that Eastern landscape, um, we shifted the road. So we had more of the right of way that we gained with the uh, lane reduction on the north side. So when you're driving along that curve, you see more of this landscaping and it helps block the um, cars and the parking lots and some of the driveways. And then as redevelopment occurs, we in, um, to the code and to the form based code, buildings will then be moved up. And there's an opportunity to adjust that um, right of way to maybe include some more on street parking, which isn't included in this section, um, and helping to reduce the number of drive lanes. There was so many driveways here, we had to figure out where we could reduce as many as we could um, to have a continuous uh, sidewalk to make it safe for pedestrians and the bike lane that's going in. So, next slide. And then in the main street, we just see, um, you know, your main um, typical downtown look of uh, parking on both sides and wider sidewalks. Next slide. Um, and then opening back up on the west um, with the turn lanes and figuring out how to connect into our bike lane into the parking, excuse me, the parkland and trails in the area. Um, next slide. So this project is um, about to go, it has its notice, notice proceed for November 15th. We're gearing up for our initial stakeholder meetings that we'll have every month. And um, it'll be a two-year project, weather permitting, um, to be end in uh, 2023. And it's an overall cost as of right now, allocated funds at 26.2 million. Next slide. Um, I wanted to talk about some of the projects underway in regards to other economic development and public improvement projects. This map is our downtown core and represents over $108 million that have been invested, invested in the area since just 2015. Um, and a majority of that coming from private investment. It's about 40.7 uh, million of public dollars. That includes the Irving Boulevard project. And then over six, almost 67 million in um, private investment. And these are projects that are either already on the ground or starting construction within the next year. Next slide. Um, summary of these projects include some commercial. We just opened up a Starbucks. Um, we have a corridor re and a facade um, project that took a one story center block building and went to two stories and added three new businesses for our downtown. Um, we have mixed use coming in from a multifamily, um, just under 200 units for the first phase. And then there'll be a re another phase two component where retail on the bottom and 18 live work lofts up top from a mixed use uh, townhome project that includes office space. And then we have several re just pure residential um, single infill as well as um, um, some bigger complexes. Um, we have some live tech projects coming in. One that I really want to highlight is our Delaware Creek phase one and two. It was um, city owned property or we bought it. It had um, dilapidated apartment complexes. We demolished those, partnered with a developer who brought in 83 single family homes, zero lot lines. So helping to create the density that we need downtown. 
Um, and it was a very successful project. I'll get to some of the value outcomes here in a second, but um, it's turned out to be, um, we're about to go out to phase three for that project. Next slide. So in addition to the private, we've been continuously um, investing public dollars. So Irving Boulevard, another big one is our Heritage Park where we combined three acres of downtown land to expand the Heritage Park that was there um, previously and have now, it's almost, it should be open the next month. It'll have an amphitheater um, for concerts and movie showings, a food truck area, splash pad. So creating a place for uh, amenities for the residents and as well as an attraction for visitors to the area. Uh, next slide. Um, this is a summary of just some of the downtown, like looking at what I showed you previously of downtown, of the projection map and then what has actually happened to date. So there on the uh, left is are the Delaware Creek, is the Delaware Creek project I mentioned. Both phases anticipated to bring $24 million in taxable value. Um, so going from $0 from city owned to 24, we were excited about that. And as of this year, it was at 27.2 million. And I will say phase two wasn't completely, uh, wasn't completed when they did their assessment. So um, we're very excited to see how well uh, this project has turned out in regards to turning the land to being productive again for the city. Um, and then the other three projects goes the, from left to right is the Starbucks and then the, our TOD project, the first phase, the multifamily, and then that townhome project. And, they are, Starbucks just completed, so we'll see what the assessment value comes out this next year, but the other two um, mixed income, our mixed income mixed use projects, um, I just provided what the construction cost is at this point, but we do anticipate to hit, you know, what we projected for that value in our TIF project, so um, next slide. And then this is just a summary of the first 10 years. Um, we anticipated it starting slow, uh, so, and, and waiting really until uh, Irving Boulevard's done before we really see an increase in value capture here. And then also um, our Dallas County contribution will kick in this next year. So I, I didn't have audited numbers yet of 2020 to be able to add to this, but we're looking at a fund total unaudited close to $860,000. Um, and that's not including the Dallas County. So we're getting there, um, chipping away. Um, and we just uh, anticipate that to grow exponentially as the um, developments come online. Next slide. And I just wanted to hit on um, the strategies. Like these are the tools. We have the TIF, the zoning put in place so we can see the form that we want. Um, we have city owned property that we're putting out uh, and can control what that development looks like. But there are other tools that we are looking at to help continue the momentum of our TIF and improve the value capture that we're getting. So continuing land bank strategy, um, we are allocating dollars to um, acquire additional properties in the downtown, um, continuously putting more dollars towards our facade enhancement programs. And this will help for the entire corridor, not just the downtown. Looking at how to repurpose Main Street to potentially be a plaza or maybe adding uh, the ability to do parklets like we saw during COVID. And then also looking at targeting dollars towards housing rehabilitation. So we're able to, we have dollars now going towards um, the exterior of building uh, businesses. We want to see what we can do for our residential market as well. Next slide. And then other tools to add is looking at neighborhood empowerment zones, uh, amending our uh, heritage crossing zoning to um, keep up with the market trends that we're seeing, adding in the missing middle housing types, um, that we recently had a whole nother project for a housing study for the entire city. So taking the recommendations from there. Um, next slide. And then lastly, how do we communicate that out to um, the businesses to help empower them to um, form and, and, and organize downtown, doing events, and then communicating all of this work out to the developers um, to track them to the downtown redevelopment. So went through that quickly. Um, Look forward to answering y'all's questions. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Emil. Emil. It's a great presentation. Um, uh, really fantastic to see all the progress being made there, because as you noted, NCT COG has invested some of our regional uh, dollars into uh, success of this station area around the Trinity Railway Express. Um, so a lot of exciting stuff. Uh, I want to give the audience uh, like a minute or two, just if there are any specific questions on something you heard 
um, to, to clarify on, since I need, really thank you for covering all the details and, and those tools uh, you mentioned uh, there as well. And I'll note, Emil has provided some slides on additional design slides that we'll have posted on the website um, for what things are projected to look like as well. Um, so yeah, really good stuff. And Emil, you mentioned one of y'all's next steps was to understand the market uh, relative to your zoning. Are y'all planning on doing like a full market study for the, the district? Um, not at this time. This is really um, going to be um, a move with our planning department. It's in the works of just how do we clean up things that were missed in our, the first iteration of that. Um, so as projects have come in, it's thing. It's been um, items that we've noticed, like oh, why did why did that get left out? Or we should have this to make sure we see the exact form that we want, or just ambiguities within the zone um, uh, within the zoning. And then um, I don't, there hasn't been talks of a market study per se, but it's not to say that one wouldn't happen. It's just not happening in the next year. So I would say if that's more of the long-term strategy of having that updated. Um, Cause the other part is hopefully expanding our zoning um, as the downtown takes off. We hope to see this zoning expand. Cause I mentioned, we used to have an overlay and it was much larger. It went, um, you know, in all directions around what we what we have now. So we hope to expand it back out to that to have more of a this traditional neighborhood development in the area. All right, good to know. Sounds like some logical next steps there. Well, if you'll hang on, we'll bring you back for the panel conversation in a minute too. All right, so I'm gonna move on to our next speaker, which will be Mr. Peter Braster with the city of Plano. So Peter, take yes. away. Oh, thank you. Uh, so unlike um, Irving's uh, project, this doesn't really have a transportation component, but I think the uh, tools we use to uh, create a public-private partnership to get this done um, is definitely transferable to transportation projects, both uh, streets and roads and uh, transit, um, both. So um, this is a, a short presentation on the Collin Creek to redevelopment. It talk, talks a little bit about zoning, but mostly dives into how we financed, uh, did the public-private partnership financing. So the mall itself uh, is uh, sort of this block uh, right off of 75, just north of PGBT. Um, the project area is really the central port part of this donut. Um, I like this slide because it shows you just how complicated real estate is when it, you're talking about regional malls. Um, so uh, we really are talking about this core thing, thing that's surrounded by the parking fields and the ring road. Next slide. Again, this 99 acres here in the middle. We did establish a TERS over the whole thing, about 300 acres, but the project itself is these 99. Next slide. So in all, the developer has proposed a plan and they've just started constructing, but I wanted to show you sort of what we were up against with retail in this market. Um, you can kind of see by the names on the screen why this mall died. Um, you had uh, Macy's, Sears, Dillard's, and JCPenney. The, I think the only viable concern right now is Dillard's, um, and they had left several years ago. Uh, the plan for the mall is to keep the central corridor, that stuff bounded by the yellow line, and then redevelop everything else. Um, you saw from the, the parcel maps that uh, the real estate acquisition process would, was hard. Um, also underlying that is all the different um, um, stuff on title that you need to, to obey one another's rules and regulations. So it's really hard to get these things done. Luckily enough, the developer was actually able to acquire all 99 acres under one ownership. Next slide. And so they, we worked with them to develop a plan of mixed uses um, that is pretty dense. Um, as you can see, there are no more open parking fields. Uh, everything is garage parked. There's a mix of uses. Um, the uh, Mostly the townhouse surrounding it on the I'm um, sorry, north is to the left. So on the south, the east, the west side, which abuts a single family neighborhood. And then you get higher uses, higher density uses and higher building heights as you move towards 75. The yellow dash lines represent parking garages. 
Um, the one, the smaller one on the west side is actually not going to happen. Um, they're going to embed them in the multifamily on either side of that park. It was supposed to be a park on the roof. The park remains. The garage does not. But the larger dashed area is the major parking garage. It's almost 2,000 square uh, spaces. Next slide. So here's sort of the, the mix of this urban center. In uh, Plano, we call them uh, urban mixed use um, zoning, so UMUs. This is, I think, UMU number four. Um, and they're the same, but all a little bit different. So here's your uses. There's, uh, to note, there is a lot of uh, residential here, almost a little over 3,000 units uh, of residential and a mix of single family and multifamily. Um, Moving on, next slide. So here's a, a sort of a massing diagram or a, a rendering of what they think could happen. So included on all these apartments and uh, townhomes is some office and a hotel. The developer owns hotels and so is keen on putting one in as well. The office most likely will be spec uh, or build a suit. So, oh, that's fine, Travis, next slide. So one of the ways we, captured and being able to do these all these public improvements is a public improvement district. Um, this was a first for Plano, which to do one that is uh, sort of using our the bonding capacity of the PID and the levies to bond and pay for public infrastructure. Again, this is all, um, they only do pay for public infrastructure. Um, so that's water streets, sewer roads, things like that. Parks is okay, of course. Um, it is not a, a it's not a separate political entity, uh, but a, a, a district, um, but it does not, uh, these kind of bonds uh, that do not um, infringe on our financial capacity at all, because they are revenue bonds. The picture you see here is the uh, looking from the west to east through the mall. They're going to sort of uh, strip out the center and create this grand two-story paseo that's open to the air. Um, with corridors leading um, north and south off of it that will be air conditioned. Next slide. So there will be two PIDs, um, both east and west. The reason there are two is because of the uses um, and being able to levy appropriately um, for the benefit of each of the parcels. Next slide. So the East PID, which is the most commercial of it, including the retail, it has the most bond, uh, was the, the biggest one at a little over 31 million uh, in bonds that were sold um, to cover uh, the, the costs. Next slide. Uh, like, likewise, the, East, the West PID, um, again, covers uh, infrastructure costs, but it is smaller. Um, there is less costs associated in here, so the, therefore it is less. Um, the levy on each of these will probably be somewhere around 40, uh, I believe it's set at 48 or 49 cents, which is even a little bit higher than what our levy is for property tax, but a lot lower than PIDs in Collin County. Some of them are upwards of a dollar on the levy. Next slide. We also used tax increment financing. And the way we use this is different for Plano. We've always done a pay as you go. Uh, this one is ended up to be something different. Um, we didn't necessarily want to do it this way, uh, but we ended up having to do it. Um, and I'll explain that in a second. Next slide. And so I, I think we've already covered TERS. So uh, next slide. Uh, but my point of contention is um, TIF financing and TERS are same but different. TERS, of course, is the place, and a TIF is the thing. So uh, just my little pet peeve on that one. Um, next slide. So here's the terrace number four. It's 300 acres um, <clears throat> with most of the <clears throat> increment coming from the 99. Next slide. Uh, there we have it. So uh, we are estimating some revenues. As you can see, uh, the 99 acres, um, as opposed to the remaining 200 or so, um, really generates the most amount of money. Um, and that it is quite a bit uh, if you add it all up. Um, we have the county, which is probably the last tourist Collin County will do, um, but they're involved as well. They're capped at 30 million. We don't have a cap on ours. Um, we just have a year, a, uh, the 36 year increment. We ended up um, deciding to sell the revenue stream to a, a firm called Oryx who put it on the market. Um, and 
what this does is uh, others have done this, but this is the first city to do it directly. Um, and uh, again, this does in fact does not make us an obligated party. Um, it also does not uh, put any risk to the city. Oryx has associated all the risk. So they have, um, unlike what COG requires, we are not we are uh, pledged to re spend um, give them the increment over the life. But if the increment doesn't realize, we don't owe them any over the time. So that is was the big thing. This rep, the 38 million um, on based if you look up top the 164, you'd get um, which is quite a big difference, but it represents about a nine percent uh, what is it um, present value, I think. Um, so there you have it. Um, next slide. Yeah, so the, all of that money uh, that was generated socially from the tours went to pot, pay for this big parking garage. It has uh, three different uses, uh, retail, re uh, the residential, and um, at one point in time it was a hotel, but they've taken that away. So it really only has the two uses. So the uh, residential will be gated and, and shoved away from the free uh, parking. Originally, this was going to be a condo. I still think it's going to be a condominium um, because the potential different ownerships between the mall and the multifamily. I think that's my no, next slide. So all in all, uh, this, this is a lot of money that we put into this project. Um, we had been uh, having some other revenue bonds of uh, both parks and um, uh, some retail revenue bonds out there. So all in all, the city put in so about 50 million, there's about 46 million in, in PID bonds. So all in all, there's about $96 million worth of public money into this project. And that what that does is it builds out all of the road network. Um, what we found comforting, if you will, was that all this money is now available and can only be spent on the infrastructure. Um, all cost overruns are done by borne by the developer, but the risk to the city is borne down a little bit. So say after the infrastructure happens and nobody builds anything, we now have um, pad sites available for sale and be able to go out to anybody then can come along and develop them within the zoning. But at least we know that all of this infrastructure will be built, including the large garage. Um, all of this money was put into a trust um, and to be paid for out of the trust. So the developer really doesn't get any money in his hands. He has to submit um, payment applications and then gets reimbursed for any expenditures. Overall, this represents about a 10% uh, investment by the public into the project with the uh, other 90% um, borne by the developer. Next slide. So one of the other uh, zones we have is a silver line zone. Um, we're not the only one. I think Richardson has one as well. Um, but uh, so we, this is church number three. Um, we established this uh, soon after uh, uh, Start, uh, announced the project and we asked for help in financing it. Um, so this covers two stations. Next slide. Uh, we're of course at the, the eastern end of the project. Next slide. I'm assuming everybody knows what Silver Line is. Um, so there's a 12th Street station in Shiloh Road. At 12th Street, there is actually two stations. One, a retrofit station into the red line um, that allows for a transfer to the at grade station on for the silver line. Next slide. And here's sort of a plan of that. Um, next slide. There's the Shiloh Road station. Next slide. And Shiloh Road is at the end of the line. It also is in a, a major industrial park for us. So I think it'll be a really great way for people to get to work in that part of town. There's a lot of jobs out there. Um, Tours number three is uh, we. Uh, pledged a maximum of $12.3 million to use for funds on the civil line. They have to be used within the zone, that's state law. Um, so far, we've collected a little over 150,000 for them. Um, the interesting thing with this one is, again, um, there, it's, a it's not a guaranteed amount, it's a maximum amount. So they, they get what we, we give them, um, what is generated. It is 50% uh, of, of uh, city funds go into that. There's no county participation in this. Um, we also, um, next slide. 
Um, so here's the area for the station, and I'll, I'll explain to this why. This is new properties not affected by a current TIF or TERS, uh, TERS number two, which is a downtown one, which is helping downtown redevelopment for years now. Um, so these are the properties. Um, unlike Irving, we didn't want to open it up and extend it and recalculate the base here. So what we did is um, uh, put those properties that are in a half mile distance into a new TERS, TERS number three. Next slide. And then um, did sort of an overlay faux TIF kind of thing uh, for those properties within the TERS too. And uh, just do a budgeting transfer of those properties increment. So 50% of the increment that we receive, we actually take 100% increment in TERS number two or TIF number two. And um, so 50% of that, so half of what we collect now goes to the silver line for those properties that are, you can see dotted. Um, the, uh, white area is a historic residential area that's exempted out of the tourist number two. Next slide. And then of course, Shiloh Road is a little more um, straightforward. It's just all those properties within a half mile walking distance. Next slide. And that's all I have actually. So two different tours, two different things doing. This one is complete value capture for Silver Line. Nothing more, nothing less. It's a one project project plan. And then, of course, uh, Collin Creek is the more interesting one because of all the overlapping things that are made, not necessarily to fund transportation, but certainly to fund a project and public infrastructure. Uh, the most unique thing about that, of course, is the selling of the revenue stream. I think there's only four in Texas, and we were the four. So that concludes my presentation. Thanks, Peter. A lot of interesting uh, details, and thank you for sharing all those details on, on that project. Uh, I want to open it up now in case anybody has uh, any particular detailed questions for Peter before we move on to our next speaker. Uh, Peter, I did want to clarify one thing I think you mentioned that was an important distinction, uh, tax increment revenue versus tax increment finance. And I believe you said something to the effect of y'all, many of the, the tax increment reinvestment zones, y'all had done pay as you go previously. So for example, like the downtown uh, TRAZ was generating enough revenue to, to help pay for projects uh, without having to borrow. Is that correct? That's correct. Yep. That was, so if we have the money, um, that one is generating a little over $2 million a year. So generally we have the money to do stuff um, every year. We don't do, uh, we do, uh, we do at least one new project a year, one sort of big new project a year. Um, but we do, it's been uh, active for quite a while now. More than, it's uh, almost 20 years, I think. Um, and it has about 10 more to go. So I think that that one is sort of the real typical pay as you go, um, you know, using it to create more revenue, generating more revenue and all that kind of thing. Civil Line is a little more different. It's newer, so you don't get that big jump in revenue um, but uh, it is again another pay as you go so if as we get it we can give it to dart or wait till the end and give it all to dart as a lump um, but yeah very interesting well uh, i think uh, i don't see any other questions in the queue so i'm gonna go ahead thank you peter and turn it over to tom and if you'll stick around we'll bring you back for the panel conversation all right, so I'm really pleased to have Mr. Tom Yancis uh, from the city of Taylor, Texas, uh, join us uh, to give us some perspective on, I think, a, a bigger scale uh, value capture issue. Uh, and I heard him present before, so I'm, I'm really pleased, Tom. Thank you for uh, taking time to join our, our panel. Yeah, thanks, Travis. It's uh, great to hear all the exciting stuff that's going on up in North Texas. and. What's really uh, great about the intro of all these other presentations to mine is that it has gotten us thinking about um, uh, value capture and economics as a key component of how we think about land use. And that's really the, the whole point of my presentation. So let's go to the next slide. So um, I'm gonna talk about a few things here and I want to um, you know, make sure that we leave time at the end for our panel discussion, but uh, we're gonna talk about the link between land use patterns and the financial resiliency of a city. Next slide. Um, how do we evaluate the financial performance of a development proposal specifically? 
And then next slide. And then finally, how to determine if your development regulations within your city actually hurt or hinder your city's ability to create financially resilient places. Next slide. All right, so this first part, we're gonna really talk about how do you figure out the link between our land use patterns and whether our cities are able to actually generate the revenues that we need to be able to pay for our services and infrastructure costs. Next slide. So if you think about um, cities, they're basically a, um, uh, it's a finite amount of land. Uh, many of you guys up in North Texas are more landlocked than some of us down here in Central Texas are. So it's even more important that you think about the ultimate financial productivity of all the land within your city limits boundary. Uh, think of it like a farmer does his farm. He has a finite amount of land that he can uh, cultivate crops on. So he wants to cultivate the most financially productive crops that he can. So he makes the highest return on his uh, labor and uh, uh, the amount of land that he has. The city should do the exact same thing. The only difference is that our crops are the land uses that actually grow out of the ground within our corporate boundaries. So this is a slide that is out of um, our uh, recently updated comprehensive plan in Taylor, where we did a deep dive really into the um, fiscal sustainability of our community's land use patterns. So you see on the left hand side there, that's our historic Main Street, and it was uh, created at the turn of the 20th century. And uh, it is a very financially productive uh, part of our community. And you can see how you can calculate uh, the property tax revenue that's generated per acre of land within the city. And in the downtown, we're generating about $16,000 of property tax revenue per acre. You can compare and contrast that to newer development patterns that are uh, more suburban in nature, uh, as the image on the right shows a uh, drive through restaurant uh, on the fringes of our city on the north end that was developed in the 1980s and 90s. And you can see that this uh, piece of property, basically the same size as the downtown tract, uh, generates uh, about uh, $6,600 of property tax revenue per acre. So it's not nearly as productive of a land use pattern. And you can see why. The image on the left shows you that the majority of the footprint of that uh, tract of land is taken up by buildings which are generating property tax value, whereas the, prop the image on the right shows you that uh, the majority of the tract is actually made up of parking and drive aisles and, and those don't generate hardly any revenue for the community. Next slide. So um, as we continue to look at the, these patterns, you, you can zoom out in scale to larger uh, areas. And again, here we, we looked on the left at you know, a, a bigger chunk of our downtown, the traditional grid of about 10 and a half acres. And it um, generates about uh, $12,000 of tax revenue per acre. And that includes an entire city block that is of uh, non-tax, non-taxable uh, property that's a city park. And then we compare that to our audio oriented big box store of about 17 acres and that generates about $4,600 of property tax revenue per acre. So a lot of times we as planners, um, as we're evaluating new proposals, we don't do the math um, on whether these uh, developments are actually going to generate sufficient revenue to pay for the services and infrastructure maintenance costs that they need. I was um, you know, kind of taken by the conversations up to this point about how much focus goes into the finances of redevelopment projects, especially those where the city is investing money of its own, either out of its general fund or out of its tax increment reinvestment fund. Uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about what is the return on that investment going to be uh, when we're thinking about redevelopment projects. We don't do nearly as much of that when we're thinking about the first time a piece of property is developed. And I think part of the reason for that is that the city isn't investing the money up front in most instances for the first time that a property is developed. Uh, the developer pays for the costs of infrastructure and then turns that over to the city for long-term maintenance. Uh, but cities really should be more in the driver's seat of thinking about what is going to be the economic uh, return on investment of every land use decision that it makes because long-term, it's the city that has to take care of the maintenance and service delivery costs associated with those developments. And we have to make sure that they generate sufficient revenue that we can do so. Next slide. 
So this was an interesting example. A lot of times, uh, as I'm sure in all of y'all's communities, you have um, uh, failing streets that you have to, that the city has to go in and, and repair or replace over time. This is a street in an older part of Taylor uh, that we needed to go in and completely reconstruct because it had reached that failing state. And so the overall um, total project, including the street and utilities, was a little over, little over a million and a half dollars. But just the, the cost of the of the street reconstruction component itself was eight hundred seventy five thousand dollars. And we calculate that the life of that uh, investment is about twenty years. So that street will last about twenty years before it has to undergo another reconstruction uh, project. We have really bad soils in our part of uh, the world, and so uh, the, the streets don't last nearly as long because. Of that. So about every 20 years, we're going to have to invest $875,000 uh, replacing these streets if we want to keep good quality streets within our community. And so we did this exercise of figuring out, well, what about these land uses that are adjacent to this street? How much property tax revenue are they actually generating to allow us to have the, the necessary funding to actually do this project every 20 years? And what we found was that we're generating about $13,000 annually in property tax revenue from these adjacent land uses to the street. If we were to dedicate 100% of that property tax revenue annually to street maintenance, which we all know we don't in our cities, we just generate, a, uh, we, we dedicate a fraction of our property tax revenues to street maintenance. But if we, if we allocated 100%, it would take 65 years uh, to pay off that $875,000 investment. So that's just not a financially viable way to operate a city. We have to have land uses that are adjacent to our infrastructure investments that actually generate sufficient tax revenue to be able to pay for that long-term maintenance and operations costs uh, in perpetuity. And so that was a key focus of our comprehensive planning process was to figure out how do we incorporate this evaluation tool and uh, this analysis into our decision-making process for new development as well as redevelopment. Next slide. All right, so the next part of the presentation is really looking at a specific development proposal and thinking about it from a financial resiliency standpoint. Next slide. So we still have a lot of undeveloped land uh, in and around Taylor, and we have a lot of proposals for new single family residential neighborhoods, which I'm sure some of y'all do as well. And so one of the uh, tools that we're preparing in our um, uh, development regulation update is a tool to be able to analyze the uh, ability of a development proposal to actually generate sufficient revenue to pay for itself over the long haul. And so I'm not going to read through this uh, list of uh, uh, variables that you need, but there's a list of variables and um, I'm happy to share this uh, with y'all afterwards if anybody's interested in doing this analysis on, in their own community. Next slide. All right, so the, the, the key thing here to figure out uh, or to think about is what are we trying to figure out? So we're trying to figure out basically three things. How much is it going to cost to replace the streets in a new development at the end of their useful life? And then how much will the development actually contribute over that same time period, period toward street maintenance? And then what's the difference between the two numbers? Is it a positive or a negative? Next slide. So this is an actual new neighborhood proposal that um, was submitted to the city for um, uh, consideration and approval. Uh, we did not, unfortunately, have this evaluation tool in place at the time that this application came through, or we might have made different choices. Uh, but as you can see, uh, all those variables that I talked about in that first slide are there along the top of the spreadsheet. We want to know um, how many linear feet of streets are we going to have in this new development? Um, what's the street width? Um, what's the lane width? And, and that's an important calculation to figure out um, uh, the cost of a lane miles worth of uh, reconstruction. And then how many uh, lots are there going to be, how many housing units, and what do we anticipate being the projected average value of the properties as they develop. And then the really important part of this is figuring out how much of your city's general fund budget is actually allocated towards uh, street maintenance. And in our case, it's about 11%. You can see that's the number up there on the top line. And then how much of our um, tax revenue actually comes how, how much of our general fund revenue is actually made up of uh, property taxes. And in our case, it's 48%. So if you know all those variables, you can kind of run the numbers here to figure out, is this going to be a, a money winner or a money loser? And what we found in doing this analysis was that the way that it was originally proposed, 
uh, it was going to come out to an annual deficit per lot of about $308 and then an overall deficit of about $2.4 million over the life of the streets. So we know that if we were to look at this through the lens of this financial resiliency tool, we would need to do something different to make this project actually be able to uh, pay for itself. Next slide. So the cool thing about this tool is actually you can tweak the variables. And so uh, one of the tweaks that we did was we um, uh, tweaked the street width and we changed it from our standard uh, 30 foot wide uh, single family residential street widths to uh, 28 foot uh, pavement width. And that obviously lowers the cost of reconstruction in the future. But the biggest impact was really when we looked at the number of lots and we increased that uh, by 50%. Uh, and that gets to this whole concept of the land actually being this um, scarce resource that you need to make the most use out of from a financial resiliency standpoint. We needed to increase the amount of tax revenue that was being generated per acre. And the way to do that was to increase density of development. So if we were to have done those two things, what we would have found is we would have had uh, an actual uh, positive result at the end of the life of the streets. And, and this neighborhood would have uh, generated sufficient revenue over that lifetime of the streets to actually pay for the reconstruction costs. Next slide. All right, so the next part of this presentation is really to figure out um, is your are your development regulations in your city actually helping you or hurting you in terms of being able to create financially resilient places. Next slide. So what are some of the characteristics? And we um, used uh, Kevin Shepard's firm, Verdunity, who is uh, probably familiar to many of y'all to do our land use fiscal analysis. And, and these are characteristics that came out of that analysis. Um, it, the, the characteristics of high uh, productivity land uses are that they have a high ratio of building footprint to lot size, that they are mostly multi-story structures, they have narrow lot frontages, they're small lots that are, that they allow for small lots uh, that would also allow for small buildings and that um, they incorporate narrower streets in a grid pattern. All right, next slide. So when thinking about your own development regulations, um, this is where I think we have an interactive question. So you guys can uh, scan the QR code there if you wanna answer these questions. Um, you need to have a high ratio of building footprint to lot size. So how do you get that through a development regulation? You either have to have a, um, a minimum lot coverage or a frontage build out requirement that ensures that you make the most use of the parcel of land that's being developed. Um, in terms of ensuring that you get multi-story structures where those are appropriate, um, do you actually have a minimum number of stories requirement or an FA or a minimum FAR in, uh, in place? And then related to narrow lot frontages, uh, do you have a maximum lot width or a frontage build out requirement? Again, that, that gets you to that, um, ensuring that you're making the most use of the frontage of the lot. And then finally, small, or actually uh, the next one is small lots that accommodate small buildings. Uh, do you have in your regulations a maximum lot square footage with no minimum building size? And then it, as it relates to narrower streets in a grid pattern, do you have maximum street widths and maximum block sizes? Okay, so uh, Travis, how do we uh, handle this uh, response? Yeah, so we'll... Sid Sydney shared the uh, link there in the chat and we had the um, QR code here. Let me just pull up our uh, slide poll. Sure, while Travis is doing that, I'll just tell you real quick. I did this analysis in, in our community, and here's the answers that I would have given if I had uh, done that QR code poll just now. It would have been no to everything except for the last question, which was a no and a yes. So for the most part, um, it was um, it, it, it's, it's enlightening because we know why we're not getting the types of places that we need to get. All right, we got okay. one person that said no. <laughs> Looks like uh, <laughs> we may have had some challenges here getting to the poll from others. Yeah. Um, That's okay. We can, we can talk through it in the, in the, in the, uh, yeah, let me let's session. get back to, uh, if y'all want to continue answering that question, go, go for we it can, and we can go back to it later. Exactly. But, all right. 
Um, so, and I, what I want to do is kind of walk through just briefly these, these answers, because most of what our development regulations that, that most of our jurisdictions are administering are, are holdovers from an earlier era. And what those regulations were trying to do was actually to decrease density and increase um, uh, buffering between land uses. And what that does is it, is it actually creates these low density sprawling places that are not financially resilient. So um, we heard from our prior presenters about uh, efforts to implement form-based codes and, and uh, zoning reform. And that's critically important if you wanna try to create uh, places that actually perform better from a long-term financial perspective. All right, next slide. So anyway, we know that um, uh, if we all answered these questions honestly uh, from our own communities, we would find that most of us have uh, these leftover regulations in place that actually hurt our ability to become financially resilient. Next slide. But as I uh, like to tell everybody, you, you don't have to despair because we know that we can figure out these characteristics of financially resilient places. And this is a slide basically of we did this this land use fiscal analysis and identified the top 10 locations generated the most revenue per acre in our city. Um, the sad part was that um, every single one of these was uh, platted or, or the, the lot created um, uh, before the 20th century, so in the late 1800s. Um, so we did a good job back then of figuring out how to create financially uh, resilient land uses. And what we need to do is go back to that DNA that we uh, can find in our own communities and figure out how to draft our regulations in a way that helps us uh, replicate those land use patterns in new development. Next. So again, this is the, um, the original town plat of the city that was done by the, uh, by the land company that was anticipating the coming of the railroad. And of course, they were in it for profit. And so they wanted to figure out what is the um, most efficient way that I can lay out this town uh, to be efficient in terms of the amount of infrastructure I have to build and how many lots I can sell uh, to pay me back for that infrastructure investment. So they were very focused on the financial return. And it has all those characteristics, the narrow lots, the grid street pattern, the high percentage of lot coverage and multi-story buildings. Next slide. So the bottom line is you have to align your development regulations with the outcomes that are most financially sustainable for your community, which means that we as planners actually have to be thinking about the financial uh, results that we're going to get from the land use decisions that we are recommending to our planning commissions and city council. And if you do that, you'll get the next slide, more of this type of land use pattern on the left and less of the land use pattern there on the right. Next slide. And at a grander scale, you'll get neighborhoods that look more like that on the left, which are um, mixed use and um, highly efficient land use patterns and less of the, the uh, sprawling and low density monoculture developments that you see there on the right. Next slide. And then your city ends up like uh, the woman on the left here who is excited and has all the money that she needs to do the things that she wants to do and not like um, the slide there on the right where your uh, city is broke and doesn't have the ability to uh, provide the services and infrastructure maintenance that the community uh, needs and demands. Next slide. That's it. I'll turn it back to you, Travis. Thanks, Tom. That was a, a great presentation. And I uh, really like you know, the, the point you made there. Again, as, as an agency focused on transportation funding, uh, we need our cities to be really uh, looking at how they increase their possible revenues as well. Uh, and so uh, I want to use the time we have remaining, about 20 minutes, to have some discussion here on what we've talked about today. And um, as we're doing that, uh, Sydney, do you think you can drop the uh, link to the chat back in there? I uh, want to just sure. give anyone else uh, a chance to uh, input uh, uh, responses. There's the QR code if you want to scan that for those questions while we're talking. Uh, but I want to bring back uh, Emilda and, and Peter, who who just uh, uh, heard uh, Tom's presentation. And so Tom, you're, you're from Taylor, Texas, which I believe is in sort of the greater Austin area-ish Central Texas <laughs> zone. Um, and, and That's so, right. Yeah, I didn't I didn't mention that. Yeah, Taylor is about 25 miles northeast of uh, Austin and due east of Round Rock. 
And so you guys have a little bit of open space, but I know Plano, Irving, both communities surrounded by other North Texas jurisdictions. So um, y'all, y'all both discussed, you know, special districts where you've got uh, tax and increment finance and PIDs happening. Do you see general uh, fiscal resiliency strategies spreading to broader segments of your community where you're you're looking at, you know, how do you maximize the uh, revenue for new development? I'll start, I'd say we're starting that. Um, our planning department right now, we're going through a whole um, redo of our, of our zoning <clears throat> and updating it, um, part of it to meet some of the market that we're seeing and taking into consideration land use and, um, you know, the financial impacts to, to the city. Um, looking at getting some technology to and software to look at that. So we're at the beginning of that. I'd say the best that we have is the zoning in the Heritage Crossing where we start to take some of those um, principles and put them into play. But that's kind of getting back to your question that you had for me at the end of my presentation. Those are the things that we're trying to, in updating the zoning, things that were missed um, on some of these the ratios, like we don't have FAR requirements. Um, the, I think the biggest thing that we have is we're just trying to move the buildings up to the street versus having all the parking in front. Um, and then we have, you know, minimum, uh, we have maximum setbacks, basically the opposite of what you would see in traditional development. So I'm having to switch my mind when I'm thinking about it, um, you know, of a minimum setback versus maximum. And then, um, the build to zone. So it's just thinking of it in that sense to try and get at least the building where we want it to hopefully um, encourage the, the development that we're seeing. So really appreciate Tom, your presentation. It's, we always wanna, we're, our, our planning department's continuously trying to re-educate um, everyone from planning and zoning to council to, to say, this is what's going to help work for our city to produce those taxable dollars. So. Yeah, I, I wish I had a better answer for you, but I'm not in planning, so I'm not so <laughs> sure what they're doing. I know um, if they're using any of these tools. I know there's been uh, a lot of pushback lately, and there's been a redo of the comprehensive plan uh, based on um, a lot of the community's pushback. Well, not a, I shouldn't even say a lot. Some vocal parts of the community to um, push back on density. So I think we're recalibrating everything is the best answer I can give you. Yeah, I think that, Peter, that's a really uh, excellent point that, uh, and we've experienced it through our comprehensive plan update process as well. We, we have had uh, people in existing neighborhoods who are nervous and, um, and not in favor of increasing densities in and around their neighborhoods. And so we've really spent a lot of time trying to uh, drive home the message of uh, the city's economic health long term and our ability to provide services and infrastructure maintenance. Um, but it's it's a tough conversation to have sometimes with folks. And one, one person in one of the public meetings asked, who's putting this thing together, a bunch of accountants? And, um, uh, you know, my response is, well, well, maybe that would have been a good thing, you know, longer ago if we had had more accountants sort of paying attention to, to the land use decisions that we were making because we yeah. would not have ended up in the position that we, we are in. I think Plano is really lucky, I think, about almost half of our revenue comes from commercial properties, existing commercial properties. And uh, that's probably not gonna change. If, if anything, it, it's going to uh, take over the single family value, um, but because that's the trend. Uh, that being said, I think um, our residents don't quite understand the whole economics to your point, Tom. Right. I don't think they whole, understand the whole economics of it and, you know, how we were able to maintain uh, like the lowest tax rate in Collin County um, yet have a lot of aging infrastructure more than our neighbors. So I, I think there's still a lot of education to do. I, I'm, I'm just not so sure that right now is the right time to, for them to be open to it. Yeah. So that's the struggle. Yeah, I'm glad, Tom, you brought up the um, public engagement piece. I'm, I'm wondering, uh, do you guys think we need to be taking this message? And, you know, Peter and Milda, you know our, our 
local officials here, how, how easy do you think that is to sort of engage in this conversation around uh, the fiscal elements of our, our land use and, and development decisions? I think it's really important, especially to some of the faster growing cities without the same experience. I would agree. I think it's, um, I know our council's very, um, <clears throat> has been thinking about it a lot. With a lot you know, we recently had a, a, a bond election, so there's always thoughts of how to be fiscally responsible in that. And um, it's just, I think to what Peter, you said about the public and Tom, the public engagement and the pushback of the density and how to get that, there's just that conflict. So um, we can continue, it's just going to have to be a continuous conversation and education and, you know, you're going to bring some people along and then some people not because there's a particular type, they they have invested in a community and that's the type of, um, and, you know, development that they are used to seeing and living in that it's going to be hard to change that and it's changes hard, but it's just something that we have to continue to engage and educate and then have them make the decision. So. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think that one of the things that we tried to do through our um, process was um, not make it a um, all or nothing proposition um, mm -hmm. that you can have lower density land uses, but you need to go into those with your eyes open and know that those may have to be subsidized by other land use uh, types within the community. And so we need to be sort of balancing the books across the whole community and thinking about um, we need some that are going to generate excess revenue from what they they uh, take and in order to subsidize some of the lifestyle needs or, or wants that some of the other parts of the community have. So I think it's, as long as, you know, we're making those decisions consciously as a community and knowing that some things may be uh, financial losers, but we are comfortable with that as long as we have some high performing uh, land uses someplace else. Are there any uh, topics you guys want to discuss with each other uh, before we move on to other uh, questions? I don't just impressed by all the work that everybody's doing. It's great, you know. I think um, the, the, you know, and, and like I said, I think you know those of us in public sector who really work on redevelopment projects, and I've done a lot over my career as well. You, you you're really focused on the on the metrics and the numbers and the and the financial results of of those projects because you have to be because you're spending public money. Um, I just think we need to get into that same mindset at the front end of development as well, even though it's not public money that's initially being invested, it's private money, but we still have that public responsibility long term for taking over the infrastructure maintenance of, of those places. So, um, so I just think if we had more of these types of presentations about, you know, how do you look at the financials of a development or a redevelopment project and analyze them, I think that would be helpful for our for our uh, whole profession. I'll just agree with that. I think, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it, what I've learned is it's really bringing in all the departments. That's so not just planning. It's not just economic development. I, I think we can all agree to that, but I know it's been a movement, especially once you get into bigger cities, sometimes those silos can be created, but really coming together and having everyone's viewpoint as to how it impacts the police departments, the our infrastructure long term, um, to really create this viable, sustainable development project in city. So, it's it's not just educating one um, one department or one field. It's really having all of the all city staff and your council and everyone understanding um, how it all works together. So, long term, and the Agreed. community. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah, speaking of making connections uh, for your elected officials and for everyone, I've got a question here in the chat. Um, you know, Aaron was uh, asking Tom specifically on jumping off of the recommendation to build in a gridded street pattern. Um, she's curious about use of street connect connectivity indices. Uh, but I also want to open that up broadly to everybody. You know, how important do you think it is? to really consider uh, maybe that more gridded pattern uh, with some of these. And I know both downtown Irving, Collin Creek Mall in, are encapsulating parts of that. 
I'll just answer the question that was that was that Aaron posed. That, that yes, I think um, we're kicking off the update of our uh, development regulations after the adoption of the comprehensive plan, and that'll definitely be part of that. It's in our transportation plan uh recommendations in the comprehensive plan is to uh ensure that the expansion of the street network includes the uh maximum connectivity and so that will be one of the metrics that we use to evaluate uh, new development i'll have to say on the street connectivity indices i'm not as familiar with um we work with our street departments but for downtown specifically it's a pretty gridded pattern except for how the state highway cut through so um i i i have not been part part of any of the conversations with our our traffic department on the subject so i don't know if i can quite answer that appropriately yeah likewise <laughs> Right, understandable. Uh, well, before we uh, wrap up, are there any sort of main takeaways you'd want to advise your, your fellow communities in North Texas um, for uh, implementing similar projects and really considering uh, using this uh, sort of process? Just have patience. <laughs> Development takes time. I mean, with our just Irving Boulevard, a one mile stretch has taken over 10 years to happen. So um, from it be, and I would say the idea behind it was even before that. Um, so, um, and, I, and I say that just because we deal a lot with um, uh, the community and stakeholders and wanting to hear what they want to see in the area and just having to reassure that we are on the path to get there. So it's really, but um, to get the development that you're wanting to see. But I mean, if, if there is a community that's just starting, um, just bringing your community in from the beginning and whether it's educating them on, these are the things that we're gonna have to tackle um, from Tom's presentations and looking at that, because um, it will be a mind, um, mindset change and shift um, to just understanding that development and these projects take time before you're gonna have someone that comes in and starts investing in your community and a lot of times it does take the public investment up front to get that and that's what we're um you know for irving boulevard we're putting in a lot of public investment up front and in, in uh, hopes to attract that private development so that would be my that's always my takeaway from these is it, they're all it's very exciting to see what everyone is doing but to hear um like plano's tiff it's been 20 years for their one around, I think you said downtown and it's generating and doing very well, but it's taken time to get there. And so just have to remind ourselves that it, it does take time. Yeah, I think that's the big thing is that, uh, you know, somebody asked me when's the right time to, um, somebody wants to ask me about when's the right time to, to form a, a TERS. And I said, my answer is 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, so if you're thinking you might need one, go ahead and get one started and done. You can always amend it. Um, you don't have to spend the money, uh, so but it it's it will be there when you need it. All right, yeah, and I think uh, one of the commonalities between Taylor and and the region uh, cities here is we're both under Texas law, which has uh, has those tools for us to use a variety of of development incentives and um, capacity to to make these things happen. So. Well, I uh, appreciate all of you taking time out of your, your day to uh, share what you're doing with other communities and, and Tom for you joining us in uh, this North Texas conversation. Uh, really a lot of good, good material shared. So uh, I am going to, for everyone who's listening, I'm going to put the slides on our website uh, so you'll be able to view those later. And I'm sure Peter, Amelia, and Tom, um, if anyone wants to follow up with you, y'all have got y'all's info on those. So. Uh, again, I really, really thank you. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Great. And I'm going to wrap up real quick with just a few uh, minor announcements uh, here. So um, for anyone involved in uh, transportation planning, we're hosting a uh, bike safety at the intersection workshop. This is happening um, November. Um, we encourage you to go online, check out the details there. It will be uh, two options for full day training. So head on over to nctcog.org slash intersection safety, find more info out about that. And then this is just an FYI, 
on um, some updated TOD loan guidance from the federal government. So uh, the Build America Bureau is offering uh, railroad, railroad rehabilitation and improvement financing along with uh, transportation infrastructure financing, also known as TIFIA. Um, so we encourage you to check this out if you think it might be applicable to your community or your agency um, for some projects that you have coming up. Just a element to make you aware of. Um, here's the contact info of the staff that work on this group. We really appreciate every, everyone joining us today. Uh, we anticipate we'll do probably our another quarterly meeting in January. Again, dates on specific meeting details will be posted coming up. So that concludes our task force meeting. Uh, thank you everyone for, for joining us and we uh, hope you have a good rest of the day. Thanks.